Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator of Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're doing another one of our ship comparison videos with uh, basically two different ships. Um, we're going to be talking about the Lexington class aircraft carriers and the battle cruisers of the Lexington class that preceded them uh, and how they relate to the Iowa class battleships. Before we get started, uh, you've probably heard by now that uh, the museum did not see the attendance over the summer busy season that we need to pay for operations over the winter slow season. So following Labor Day, we're closing down and uh, almost all the staff at the museum is going to be furloughed for up to the next six months until we get back to the next busy season. Because of that, our YouTube video series would have to end at Labor Day. I won't be working here anymore. If you want to keep watching these videos uh, and you want us to keep making them, we have a GoFundMe set up. Uh, check the link in the description below. And that will, um, that is requesting $20,000 to continue to run our digital education uh, and YouTube channel over the six months that the museum is closed. Uh, we've already received a tremendous amount of support from you, and uh, I hope we can count on a little bit more support to get us to that goal uh, so we can keep producing content like this. So, the Lexington class uh, has a really tortured design history. But uh, it all goes back to congressional funding. Congress was able to give the Navy typically enough money for two battleships a year. Well, two capital ships a year. And the Navy chose to continue to build uh, battleships. First the pre-dreadnoughts, and then the first generation dreadnoughts, and then the standard type uh, dreadnought battleships. And so there's a consistent run of mostly two ship classes of battleships year after year. By the standard type, they had decided to go with a 21 knot speed for the fleet. Uh, the main battery was fairly consistent. The armor plating was fairly consistent. The engineering was fairly consistent. The superstructure was fairly consistent. It was all standard. And each subsequent class had slight improvements over the class that preceded it, uh, but the whole standard type as a unit could operate homogeneously as a battle line. They all had the same speed, the same basic uh, firepower and primary and secondary armament uh, with very slight differences that were relatively easy for the American supply chain to uh, feed. While the United States is building this homogenous group of vessels, uh, other major naval powers, Great Britain, Germany, Japan, are all building uh, multiple lineages of capital ships. Uh, Great Britain started the trend with HMS Dreadnought, a 21-knot uh, first-generation Dreadnought-type battleship, and... Uh, they almost immediately release what they call the battle cruiser, which, whereas the dreadnought focused on guns and armor, the battle cruiser focused on speed and guns uh, at the uh, detriment to armor. So these ships, the dreadnoughts, replaced pre dreadnought type battleships, and the battle cruisers replaced armored cruisers. Both ships were designed to operate in the line of battle, with the battle cruisers scouting and the battleships forming the core of the line. The uh, the battle cruisers could also be detached for independent operations, either raiding enemy commerce or protecting Allied commerce by destroying enemy commerce raiders. Furthermore. These ships were refined into the fast battleship uh, as later generations of 
dreadnoughts came out, and this would combine all three speed, firepower, and armor in one package, typically significantly more expensive than uh, the battleships or battle cruisers that preceded them. So, these other countries have fast wings to their battle fleets, and the United States does not. Uh, and that's troubling because we do a lot of overseas commerce, uh, and we are trying to supplant the Royal Navy as the dominant naval force, and we're trying to maintain dominance in the Pacific over the Japanese. So uh, the Navy pretty early on determines that the ideal fleet would consist of 48 capital ships. There would be each a Pacific and Atlantic fleet with 20 battleships each and four battle cruisers each. Uh, so each fleet would be 24 ships with a core battle line of four squadrons of four battleships and one squadron of four battle cruisers. Uh, however, with the funding they were getting, they uh, just kept building battleship after battleship after battleship. They never got anywhere close to the 48 they were looking for. Under President Woodrow Wilson, the United States Navy uh, started to get significantly more funding during uh, World War I. The United States, of course, did not enter World War I until Europe had already been slugging it out for three years. So while these European nations are devoting all their resources to their armies, uh, their navies are not growing any larger. In fact, they're shrinking as they suffer combat losses. Uh, so the United States sees this as an opportunity. Uh, and in 1916, 16 capital ships are authorized. Six battleships of the Tennessee and Colorado classes, which are standard type. Six battleships of the South Dakota type, which are an evolutionary step above the standard type. They are massively heavier. Uh, they feature significantly more guns uh, and a slightly higher speed and thicker armor. Uh, so they are slight improvements in all fields over the standard type, but still using the standard type guns and superstructure and, and layout. And six Lexington class battle cruisers. Uh, these Battle cruisers would uh, be more or less in the standard type configuration. They would have standard type propulsion, standard type torpedo protection, the standard type armament layout and superstructure, uh, but they wouldn't have the standard type armor. So that's the beginning of the Lexington class. Initially, four battle cruisers were going to be authorized, and the Navy was going to name them Constellation, Constitution, Lexington, and Saratoga. Uh, when six were, in fact, authorized by Congress, the names became Lexington, Constellation, Saratoga, uh, United States, Constitution, and Ranger, in that order. They were going to be numbered CC1 through 6. Uh, battleships, of course, are BB, destroyers are DD. Uh, the letters don't necessarily mean anything, uh, although some people have translator, transliterated it to mean cruiser capital, as in a capital ship that is a cruiser. Uh, probably doesn't mean anything just using the double letter thing, and, and the B had already been used. A lot of people question, why did they just call them BC? That makes too much sense. Navy doesn't do stuff that makes sense. So uh, the Navy had actually been designing battle cruisers for the better part of a decade by 19, uh, 1916 when the Lexingtons were authorized. And they weren't particularly great ships and they never got authorized. Like I said earlier, uh, even though they, they produced battleship and battle cruisers designs, the uh, Congress only gave them funding for two ships, so they kept building battleships. Early designs called for less guns, but equivalent armor and higher speed uh, for the battle cruiser equivalents of battleships, like uh, the Wyoming class. These were to counter 
the Japanese uh, semi battle cruisers and battle cruisers that were either under construction or had been completed. The United States really feared uh, the commerce rating and scouting capabilities of these other nations. And the United States' own scouting capabilities were relatively low. We did not build many cruisers to scout for our fleets because we only had the money for battleships. Uh, cruisers and destroyers, of course, can be built cheaply in large numbers at the beginning of a war and come into effect within a year or two. Capital ships like battle cruisers and battleships uh, you basically fight a war with the ones you already have, either mostly completed under construction or in service. So the U.S. Navy very consciously decided not to make cruisers and destroyers in large numbers before the war uh, and to focus on capital ships. So uh, during the battle cruiser design process, the... Uh, Armor starts to drop out in a very British fashion uh, to be replaced by guns. And these were going to be the core scouting components of the fleet. So they would have the largest, longest range guns possible uh, and the highest speed possible with very, very, very thin armor. Uh, so this, this uh, series of large scout cruisers or large light cruisers actually very interestingly parallels uh, the British battle cruiser designs. Uh, and the first iteration of the Lexington class design that's authorized really imitates this. So these ships were going to be armed with 10 14 inch guns, similar to the Nevada class battleships of the same year, except instead of having a triple in turret with a uh, triple turret with a twin turret superimposed, they had a twin turret with a triple turret superimposed. The battleships were much wider forward and could fit that wider triple barbette forward. The battle cruisers could not, they needed the thinner barbette. Uh, so the 10, 14 inch guns, they would have the same five inch 51 caliber guns as other standard type battleships as their secondary battery. Uh, they would have the same torpedo tubes uh, and they would have as many as 24 boilers trumped into seven smokestacks. Well, only half of the boilers could fit beneath the armored deck, so the other half were completely unarmored. Uh, and these seven smokestacks were arranged, uh, some of them in pairs around the width of the ship, and other ones on center line, and other pairs, and other center line. I find the standard type very attractive. This first draft of the Lexington class battle cruisers is not attractive. Uh, another feature of the standard type was the 01 level deck was uh, ran for about half of the length of the ship. And the main deck was uh, mostly enclosed in that half and then opened back aft. Um, to get enough structure for this long, lightly built battle cruiser, the 01 level had to run uh, about 75% of the length of the ship. So unlike the other standard types, which have that drop off in the middle, uh, you see the drop off at the extreme stern of the ship. Let's see. Uh, these early battle cruiser designs would have as little as five inches of armor plating uh, for their belt, which is about one third the thickness of the battleships uh, and barely thick enough to stop a light cruiser's guns, much less armored cruisers or uh, larger vessels. Uh, uh, fortunately, boiler technology was improving and the, the United States' entry into World War II uh, meant that the 18 capital ships that they were building at the time got second priority to destroyers. We needed anti-submarine escorts to guard the fleet. So this pause in construction gave the Navy a chance to develop new technologies. Uh, and so they uh, modified their boilers. Their boilers became more efficient. So instead of needing uh, 24 with half above the armored deck, they were able to reduce it to 20. And this meant 
that they could drop them all below the armored deck for what it was worth. The armor's still paper thin. Uh, and they could reduce the number of smokestacks from seven down to only five. And these five were arranged in pairs next to each other with a fifth one in between. Um, still not an attractive ship. They also increased the main battery from 10 14 inch guns to eight 16 inch guns. These would be the largest guns yet carried by a warship. Uh, and it would give these ships the range and firepower to avoid getting into close combat. Uh, this design and the previous design were both designed to be 35 knots, which would make them the fastest capital ships by a long shot, uh, even faster than capital ships under design and development by other nations. Um, and so if they were used properly, they might just survive. They could scout for the fleet. They could provide long range uh, fire, basically snipers, and then they could run away uh, if needed. In practice, that isn't how they were used by other nations, and there's no reason to believe that the United States would have done any better. Uh, because battle cruisers have the same guns as battleships, plug them into the line of battle right next to battleships at low speed, uh, and have them slug it out. This tends to result in the battle cruisers taking large caliber shell hits from enemy warships and blowing up catastrophically. We see this at Jutland. Uh, the Americans, however, are not fighting World War I at this time, so they do not have the experience that other nations do. So Germany and uh, Great Britain are adding additional armor to their battlecruiser designs at the uh, detriment of other features. Uh, and eventually that culminates in HMS Hood, built with full experience from the Battle of Jutland, having thicker armor than contemporary British battleships. And so she becomes arguably the world's first fast battleship. Germany had been building heavily armored battle cruisers uh, all along, uh, and some people make a point that these battle cruisers can in fact be called the first uh, fast battleships. But uh, I, I tend to think they're not quite there yet. It's just Germany builds more armor into their battle cruisers with smaller guns, whereas Great Britain has the bigger guns and the thinner armor. Uh, anyway, the United States eventually enters World War I. And uh, when that happens, they become allies with Great Britain. And Great Britain shares their experience and their blueprints for HMS Hood with the U.S. Navy. Uh, so the U.S. Navy looks at Hood's blueprints and they see a 12-inch belt angled at uh, a couple of degrees to give it greater equivalent thickness. And they think, that's a great idea. So they update the Lexington-class battle cruisers to get a 7-inch belt angled at 11 degrees, which gives it the equivalent of 9 inches of armor plate. And that's significant. During World War I, no armor thicker than nine inches, uh, or nine inches or thicker, I should say, was ever penetrated by an enemy projectile. So they are actually armoring these ships as ridiculously light as the armor plating is. Uh, in theory, it's enough. Uh, in practice, other countries are increasing the size of their armor plate. Uh, German battleships had heavier armor, so they uh, were facing British 15 and 13.5 inch shells. Uh, the British ships had thinner armor, but they were only facing 12 and 11 inch shells from the German ships. Uh, in the post-World War I years, virtually all new battleships were being designed with 16 inch guns, and even some of the first 18 inch gun designs uh, were authorized, although they would not be completed. On the other side of the world, Great, uh, Japan is also an ally of Great Britain, and they are designing uh, a building program centered around battleships, battle cruisers, and fast battleships uh, called the 8-8 plan. 
And the idea was they would build eight battleships and eight battle cruisers over the course of eight years to become a major naval power. Um, and eventually their last eight ships uh, of these 16 are no longer battle cruisers or battleships. They are fast battleships. Uh, and the last four of this design, the number 13 class uh, that never received names, had 18 inch guns, eight of them. Um, they're a Kagi or a Tago class, of which a Kagi is one, had uh, 10 16.1 inch guns. Uh, this had the Nagato and uh, Tosa classes, uh, also with 16.1 inch guns. And then another class uh, basically improved Atagos that uh, also had 10 16 inch guns. So uh, these ships are all resume construction at the end of World War I. The United States' is building program, Japan's building program, and Great Britain, uh, war-weary and economically crippled from their efforts in World War I, um, have some issues keeping up. So they uh, create some really advanced paper designs, which will become the N3 and G3 uh, classes of battleships and battle cruisers, functionally uh, fast battleships and battle cruisers, which are super advanced, um, super expensive, but only ever existed on paper. And even though they're authorized, uh, no major work is ever carried out on them. And so with all of this construction going on, eight British ships and 18 American ships and 16 Japanese ships. Uh, it looks like another naval war is going to take place. Uh, a naval arms race like this led to World War I. And so the, these major powers look at what's happening and their governments look at what's happening, what they're spending after just getting out of a war. Uh, and they call a timeout. Uh, so they all meet in Washington for the Washington Naval Conference of 1922, or the uh, Five Power Naval Treaty. This is the first strategic arms limitation treaty in history. And uh, Great Britain trades their paper battleships uh, to cancel a number of American and Japanese battleships that are already well under construction. This is a brilliant diplomatic move on their side. Um, really saves the British Empire for another couple decades and probably postpones World War II or at least the Pacific part of World War II by a couple of decades. So uh, with this, the Lexington class battle cruisers are canceled. Their final form involved eight 16-inch 50 caliber guns, uh, just one less barrel than the Iowa class battleships. They would have been 860 feet long at the waterline and 106 feet wide. Uh, they would have been 100, uh, 875, or excuse me, 874 feet long overall with their uh, standard type clipper bow. Uh, so these ships are almost the same size as Iowa class battleships. While the earlier designs of the Lexington class came in around 35,000 tons, this new design uh, with the seven inch angled armored belt came in closer to 45,000 tons. Uh, the secondary battery would have been 16 six inch guns, an increase from the standard type, uh, and it would have featured six three inch anti-aircraft guns, as well as uh, some torpedo tubes that probably would have been deleted from the design before it was completed. Uh, and blessedly, blessedly, they were able to get the number of high pressure boilers down from 20 to 16, all beneath the armored deck, all trunked into just two smokestacks. Uh, and so the final form of the ship looks very much like HMS Hood, but with American standard type uh, features attached. I think it's a very attractive design. 
Um, I think it would have been interesting to see these ships in World War II. Uh, they would have made great carrier escorts, um, but they would have been very, very thin-skinned um, and would have been susceptible to sudden explosions. Now, the Washington Naval Treaty did acknowledge that all these ships were under construction and authorized the signatory powers to uh, convert two battle cruisers each uh, for Japan and the United States, or three smaller ones for Great Britain, into aircraft carriers. Um, so in Japan, these were going to be the Otago and Akagi, the battle cruisers that were furthest along. Um, Otago was destroyed in a uh, earthquake, and so it became Akagi and Kaga. Uh, in Great Britain, it was the battle cruisers Furious, Courageous, and Glorious were all converted into full deck aircraft carriers. 